this afternoon, we are going to proceed with our discussion uh, on the, the external and internal criticisms, as well as we will be discussing the categories and repositories of primary sources. Last meeting, we discussed the definition of history. We defined history, and there are different perspectives or ways of defining history. Uh, there is a traditional definition wherein, as I mentioned last time, it's based on the idea that history is the study of the past. However, we have a modern definition of history or a contemporary definition of history wherein in that contemporary history of uh, definition of history, we defined it as something that connects the past with the present as well as with the, the future. We need to check if the sources that we are using in studying a particular history is reliable, valid, or authentic. That's why before we proceed with really uh, accepting a particular facts or a particular information, we need to check first the source. And I think I explained to you last time what's the difference of a primary source and a secondary source. And obviously among the two, uh, we need to use a primary source because that is an original document that really presents the main idea or the, the truthful information about a particular event. In the case of the secondary source, or those sources or materials are just an explanation or an assessment or a review of a primary source. That's why we could not take secondary source as an evidence. They are just commentaries of a primary source. But in order for us to do that, uh, to check if the primary source is really credible or reliable, then we need to have it undergone what we call external and internal criticism. Now, uh, try to look at the screen there, if you can see it. A historian must doubt every statement until it has critically tested. The historian must make sure that the statement nga pati niya are credible. And the test could be made by employing what we call external and internal criticisms of sources. The, these are the two ways in which we could test how credible or reliable a particular material or source is. Now, we could use external criticism or we could use an internal criticism. Now, what is external criticism and how is it different with internal criticism? When we say external, that means outside, meaning we will just try to look into the outside characteristics of the source. Particularly, we will check if the source is authentic. Uh, when we say external criticism, we are looking into the authenticity of the particular document. We are looking into if the document is genuine or authentic or truthful. That's how we look into the outside characteristic of the document. Now, if we are going to compare that with internal criticism, it means establishing the historical reliability of the document. Is the document reliable? Is the document telling the truth, looking into is it, it here is the credibility of the document. Uh, is it believable? Is it truthful? Does it present something that is authentic? Okay, now that's why RJ Schaffer, uh, in comparing external and internal criticism, he said that external criticism function in a negative way because it merely saves us from using false documents. By using external criticism, we could see that the document that we are using is not hoax or it's not a fake document. While internal criticism has the positive function, positive siya because it tells us how to use paano gamiton ang truthful, authentic, or genuine nga klasisang document. 
Now, one example maybe that I could share to you is the Code of Kalanchao. It's actually an ancient Filipino document wherein it enumerates there the different rules that our ancestors was using here in Panay. Uh, that's the Code of Kalanchao here in Panay. But at the end of the day, it was discovered uh, through the study of William Henry Scott that the Code of Kalanchao is a fake document. Story of the Maragtas, uh, the, the ten Borneian Datus who came to our country and uh, what we call Barter of Panay. Now, those, those things enumerated there could not be considered as historical truth. Uh, those documents could be viewed only as folklores or what we call epic. But we cannot consider that as an example of a, an authentic document. That's why, kung may maghambal nga, dato puti, dato paiburong, and all those things, those are just based on the epic that we have, a story that we have before. But we cannot just, we cannot use that as our document, historical document. This particular line sa a point, Ang hindi marunong magmahal sa sariling wika ay daig pa ang malansa at mabahong isda. Are you familiar with that? Lines were said to have been said by Dr. Jose Rizal. And that, that those lines was actually a part or a portion of the poem sa aking mga kabata or a poem dedicated by Rizal to his fellow youth. And uh, it was said, that that particular poem was written by Rizal when he was eight years old. But there was a new study right now or discovery. Uh, and based on that discovery, it states that Sa Aking Mga Kabata was not written by Rizal. Uh, it was not Rizal who wrote that. Uh, what, what was the proof? There were several indications there in the poem that does not really uh, explain the characteristic of Rizal. Like, for example, there was one uh, term there, kalayaan. The term kalayaan, uh, it, was, it was used by Rizal. Uh, Rizal was able to use or discover the term kalayaan when he was already maybe 20 years old, uh, 20 plus years old. And he borrowed the term with Marcelo H. Del Pilar. He doesn't have the idea of what kalayan is. He doesn't have the vocabulary for the kalayan or for kalayan when he was eight years old. That's why the question there is: How could Rizal use the term kalayan when it was not yet in his vocabulary when he was eight years old? That's why a new study tend to prove that the poem was not written by Rizal. In those lines, ang hindi marunong magmahal. Sa sariling wika, daig pa ang malansa at mabawang isda. Those were the, not the lines of Jose Rizal. Okay? Now, those, those two examples that I give were examples why we need to use internal and external criticism among the documents or sources that we are using in studying history. Now, if we are going to check there, Garaghan su suggested six inquiries of source criticism. He actually divided it into higher external criticism, lower external criticism, and internal criticism. In the higher external criticism, uh, he, in order for a person to check the credibility of a particular source, that person needs to first check the date. When was the source produced? Was it produced immediately after a particular event? Or what was it produced 10 years or more after the event? Of course, if it was produced closer to the time when the event happened, that is more reliable compared to a source that was written several years after the event happened. Another one there is the location. Where was it created? Uh, where was the document created? 
was it created near the place where the particular event really happened or was it created somewhere wherein there is a tendency that uh, the information that was received was received from another person another one who was the author or by whom was it made uh, who made the source was the the one who made the source reliable or not and of course the pre-existing material where it was created we'll try to check the paper we are going to analyze the paper that was used if it was really uh, characterize it, it really characterize the the document or material of the time you know when the retraction letter of Rizal was discovered, it undergo it undergone analysis, particularly the paper that was used. If the paper was, uh, of course, present or the kind of paper is synonymous to the kind of paper that is being uh, that was being used during the time of Rizal. That's it. And of course, the lower external criticism. In what original form was it produced? Was that form present during the time of the event? That's what we call integrity. And of course, in, in the, the, the last one there, credibility. What is the value of the content of that particular document? Now, apart from that, those ways presented to us by Garagan, Olden, Jugardsen, and Thor Thorin also provided us uh, principles in which it would guide us in identifying the materials that we are going to use. Uh, these are the ways. For example, if we are going to compare two sources uh, according to these people, relics, an example of which is, or yeah, is fingerprints, relics are more credible sources than narratives. Meaning the actual material is more credible than a statement or a letter another one number two their documents may be forged or corrupted yes uh, documents may be changed documents may be uh, forged that's why the reliability of a particular document depends on the strong indications of its originality we need to check first if the document is really original if all arguments would tend to prove that the document is original, then that is reliable. Another one, number three, the closer a material is to the event it tends to describe, the more it can give an accurate description of it. That's why all primary sources or all sources that we are going to use must be or we must check sources that was made on the time closer to the event meaning it should be or it, mu it must have been produced on the time of the event maybe immediately after the event but not uh, it not farther than the time that it was or that particular event happened because the more closer it is to, to the event it tends to describe the more reliable it is and of course primary sources are more reliable than the secondary source and the secondary source of course is more reliable than a tertiary source if we are going to check also different sources maybe there are two sources or three sources and those two or three sources has the same message they contain the same message meaning the credibility of the source is also strengthened or tightened. Kung damo ang naghahambal nga muna siyang reality, therefore, the message of the source is true or that the, the source is credible. Now, try to understand also that sources tend to provide some kind of biases Therefore, what we need to do is to uh, supplement it or to make an opposite motives in order that we could minimize that particular bias. 
Now, the thing that we need to we need to understand is that the witness or the source must not have direct interest in a particular event. Why? Because if the witness or source has no direct interest in the event, then it would tend to give us an assurance that the message being put into the source is credible. Now those are the ways present that those are the ways in which we could check that the reliability or the credibility of a particular source. Now try to understand class that even though the author's trustworthiness may establish a background probability for considering a source, every piece of evidence extracted must be weighed way individually. This can ano pa na ka trustworthy or ka credible sang author. Still, we need to check the content of the source if the source is really reliable. Uh, it's not the, it's not that we just agree with the author. We need to check first the content of the source in order for us to really uh, make sure that the source is really credible. Now, of course, uh, try to remember that in looking into a more valid and reliable source, the most important thing that we need to understand there is impartiality. Meaning this, the, the, the author has no bias, the author has no interest in the event. Because an impartial source allows for an accurate interpretation of the facts be freeing the source, the burden of thorough analysis just for the actual truth to glean. Okay? Uh, the point there is, if the source is impartial, then that would make our life easy. Uh, we don't need to counter-check and to double-check if the, what is being stated there are true because we know for a fact that the source is an impartial source. Okay? Now, those are the things that we need to understand in order that we will be able to identify or check how credible, reliable, authentic, or valid a particular source, primarily in checking a primary source that we are going to use in the study of history. Now here in the Philippines, if you wanted to know more about the different primary sources that you may use if you are going to study the history of our country, then try to look into the different places where you could see uh, sources, primary sources. These are the repositories or the storehouse of Philippine primary sources. You may go to the National Archive of the Philippines when you could see their voluminous documents from the coming of the Spaniards here to the here in the country until the establishment of our republic. You could go also to the National Library of the Philippines wherein you could see there the magazines, newspapers, journals, and other recordings that you may use to a particular topic of interest that you may have someday. Another one, you may go to the National Museum of the Philippines. There were actually three national museums. The National Museum that could be found in the old legislative building. You could go also to the National Museum of the Philipp National Museum of Anthropology of the Philippines. Or you may go to another, another uh, the, Na the His National Museum for the History of the Philippines, the National Historical Museum. You, you could go visit those things. Those, those three national museums are just connected with each other there in uh, Manila. Or you may go to the George B. Vargas Museum where you could see their collections of the works of famous artists like Guerrero, Flores, Luna, and Hidalgo. Or you may go also to the Filipinas Heritage Library that's in Makati to the Lopez Museum, which is located in Pasig, or you may go to Ortega's Library, which is also in Pasig. Or even our universities, private universities, also have their own 
museums or libraries that that uh, that offers also several primary sources among which of course the Ateneo de Manila University Rizal Library if you go to the La Salle University Manila Library uh, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Nino Aquino Library and Learning Resources Center or to UP Diliman Main Library or UST Miguel de Benavides Library but of course when you go there you need to ask permission. You should have the valid reason why you're going to visit those libraries. And of course, sometimes uh, you need to coordinate to them first before you proceed to those places because those are private institutions, except UP, of course. Now, uh, apart from that, we may check also the different categories of primary sources. What, how, or what types of primary sources could be uh, considered as uh, what type of sources are considered to be primary sources. Of course, we have the contemporary records. When we say contemporary records, those records or documents that would, uh, for example, appointment notification, direction from the foreign office to ambassadors, bills or laws or tax records that are being passed by our con by the Congress. Even autobiographies, they are examples of contemporary records. But of course, before we use those things, we need to check first if those are authentic. You may use also confidential reports, but of course, that's a little bit difficult to obtain that because it's not intended for general audience. They are also less reliable than contemporary sources. Like, for example, the journals, the diaries or memoirs, and even personal letters. Uh, our, our, our national heroes have their own diaries and memoirs. But most of the time, uh, some of these diaries and memoirs would create controversy. Uh, again, just try to look into the idea that they are, con they are less reliable than the contemporary sources. Of course, you have their public reports. Examples of that are newspaper reports, memoirs and autobiographies, or official histories of the legal activities of the government or business house. Then you have also, we have also the government documents, such as the census, uh, the, the census that are being conducted is an example of a government document. Public opinion, when you write in, uh, editorials, speeches, letters, or pamphlets, that's an example of, uh, that's a category of a primary source. And of course, our folklores and proverbs. Uh, this reveals the stories of legendary heroes and tells about the aspirations, superstitions, and customs of the people. This must possess a thorough knowledge of the history of the period and distinguish legendary versus authentic elements. We could use that, but we need to check first which part of that folklore and proverb are considered to be authentic. We will proceed into evaluating a primary source and a secondary source. We are going to compare two accounts on the Tejeros Convention. Of course, we will check which of the two is more reliable we will check also which of the two uh, possesses uh, enough information about the Tejeros Convention. What's the difference and similarities between the two accounts? Because the, 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 these accounts that we are going to discuss was written by a primary source and another one was written by a secondary source. Up there, Santiago Alvarez. Now, Santiago Alvarez was a revolutionary general. He was a son or the only child of Mariano Alvarez. Uh, Mariano Alvarez was the president of the Magdiwang faction of the Katipunan. Alvarez or Santiago Alvarez has the nickname Kidlat ng Apoy. He was uh, uh, a delegate of the Katipunan, a captain general, and commander-in-chief of the Magdiwang forces. And during his lifetime, he was able to record his life as a general in a document which is uh, the Katipunan and the Revolution 
memoir of a general. Now, in that particular source, uh, the Tejeros Convention was recorded and the work of Alvarez was considered as a primary source. Now, his work on the Tejeros Convention, we are going to compare that with the work of Teodoro Agoncillo. Now, Teodoro Agoncillo was a secondary source. He was a Filipino historian. He was renowned for promoting a nationalist point of view of Filipino history. He wrote the book, Revolt of the Masses, the Story of Bonifacio in the Katipunan, wherein in that particular book, uh, a part of that or a portion of that would tend to tell us of the story of the Tejeros Convention. Now, I presented it, uh, the two accounts here. It was done this way so that we could compare uh, paragraph by paragraph the, the, the things that had happened based on the accounts of Alvarez and Agoncillo. Of course, based on the recollection of Alvarez, the Tejeros Convention happened on March 25, 1897. But in the case of Teodoro Agoncillo in his uh, research, he was able to conclude that the Tejeros Convention happened in or on March 22, 1897. Now, there are questions on the side. When was the Tejeros Assembly convened? Where was it convened and how was the venue described? How were the delegates described and where did they come? Who sent the invitations? To what faction most of the delegates belong? Why? Who presided over the meeting? Who attended the meeting? What was the confidential information received by Secretary Villanueva. What was the significant event that happened in the former summer resorts of the Friars? What was the purpose of the meeting? What was the issue raised by Severino de las Alas? What was the reply of Lombreras? What was the argument of Bonifacio? What was the counter argument of de las Alas? What was the reply of Bonifacio on the counter-argument of de las Alas? How did Montenegro defend de las Alas? What was the reaction of Alvarez? Why? Who pleaded Alvarez not to arrest Montenegro? What was his reply? What disrupted the assembly? Why was a recess called? How did the meeting resume? Who presided the meeting? Why? What was Lombrera's reason in refusing to take the chair? What was the reminder of Bonifacio? Why did the chair prepare for the election of officers? What were the positions to be elected? How? What was the proposal of Bonifacio before the election began? Fitted pieces of paper to serve as ballot. What was the warning of Mojica? Who won as president? How? 
what was the suggestion of the Las Alas? How did the delegates react? Who was elected as vice president? Who was elected as captain general? What did they do to expedite the election? Who suggested it? Who was elected as secretary of war? What position was Bonifacio elected? Why did Tirona object Bonifacio's election? Was Tirona's objection adopted? Why? What was Bonifacio's reaction? How did Tirona react? Who disarmed Bonifacio preventing a tragic affair? What was Bonifacio's feelings? How did Bonifacio adjourn the meeting? Now, if we are going, if you are going to compare the two sources, there are differences on how uh, Alvarez presented what happened in the Tejeros Convention with how uh, Teodora Goncillo presented his own story or version of the assembly. But of course, there are also similarities in the presentation. There are also similarities based on the documents or the sources. Now, among those, uh, those similarities, of course, is the idea that uh, Severino de las Alas, Severino de las Alas questioned the kind of government that the Filipinos had during the time of Bonifacio. And uh, his wish is to create a new government, a government that would replace the Katipunan. But of course, the members like Lumbreras, the chairman, mentioned that the Katipunan is already a government. Okay, but that was questioned by Las Alas if that government is monarchical or republican. And at the end of the day, Bonifacio was forced to take on the chair and preside over the election of a new government in which, in that particular case, uh, Emilio Aguinaldo was elected. Bonifacio mentioned before the start of the meeting that whatever will be the outcome of the meeting, it will be or it must be accepted. But when he was elected as Secretary of Interior, what happened is his qualification was questioned. It was questioned by Daniel Teron. The Pasha get mad and at the end of the day, he adjourned the meeting uh, saying that all those things that were discussed in the meeting were all considered null and void. Now, that's just a summary of the Tejeros Assembly. Your task this afternoon is to give the similarities and the differences between the two accounts. Apart from that, you are going to answer the questions being presented before or in the first column of the accounts of Alvarez and Agoncillo.